Okay, so without further ado, I just want to introduce uh, uh, Richard, uh, today's uh, speaker on the science uh, talk series. So the Richard is the uh, originary biologist, but he uh, did all sort of different kind of uh, exciting research along this line from biology, uh, biology to medical research and genetics. Uh, and recently he moved to uh, NIAP, National Institute of Agricultural Botany, uh, in Cambridge to start up his own uh, project uh, of a uh, group in the area of uh, understanding uh, genetic uh, basis of a uh, complex um, uh, interactions of, uh, uh, of the of crops, uh, horticultural crops. Uh, and uh, he is going to talk about designing plans for robots, so which is very interesting uh, topic for all of the robotics engineers because we need uh, certainly some help of uh, this kind of geneticist work uh, to make our robots more useful in complex tasks of agri-food uh, industry. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to uh, this talk by Richard. So without further ado, I uh, uh, give the floor to um, Richard. Looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much. So great, it's really nice to be able to talk to you today. Um, I've um, I've been very impressed with the um, doctoral training uh, center, and I really hope that as you know we start to expose all the different skills that are in the partner, um, both academic institutes and the industry partners, there can be um, some fruitful interactions. So the title of my talk today is Designing Plants for Robots. Um, slightly ambitious perhaps, but we'll we'll see how we get on. So um, first, as Fumia said, I'm uh, at NIAB. Um, in my role at NIAB, I'm Director of Crop Research. Um, and what that means is I, I sort of oversee some of the um, more research facing bits of NIAB. Um, NIAB is quite a complex business. Um, we do both research and um, contract research for industry and deliver statutory services. So we, we have a lot of different arms, but um, I'm mostly responsible for um, the areas of genetics, pathology, biotechnology, data science, um, and general crop improvement. So just so you understand what NIAB is, because we are, we are a private company, but we're a not-for-profit, um, but we um, sort of span the gap between uh, a fully um, commercial entity and a research organization. So we do hold UKRI funding, um, we are an independent research organization in our own right, but um, different to many of the research institutes in the UK, we do um, an awful lot of commercial work and over half of our um, turnover is, is commercial work for industry partners. And as part of that, we engage very much with um, the farmer and grower base um, in the UK and beyond. NIAB um, actually formed out of a partnership between between um, the university, the um, industry and the government back in 1919 to bring um, regulation to um, seed systems uh, um, back when Mendelian genetics was just starting to be exploited and um, people wanted to be sure that they were growing the right variety um, and without DNA markers uh, education systems and quality testing systems had to be set up and that's what NIAB um, in partnership with the university was designed to do. Um, but since then, although we still do that work and it's obviously evolved, um, we've taken on a lot, a lot more um, of, um, of sort of in our, our remit. Uh, most recently, we took on IBMR in 2016, where I started my career. Um, we have an agritech incubator um, that is just coming online. And we're hoping that over the next five or so years, we will grow from where we are at about 25 or 26 million turnover at the moment up to 40 million. So very exciting um, business to be in, very exciting um, space. It's already introduced me, so I will skip over this pretty quickly. Um, but just to say that I, I've always tried to work at the intersection between computational biology and um, molecular biology and genetics. And so I've been, throughout my whole career, I've been interested in how complex traits evolve um, because I, I find um, you know, the, the, the way in which natural selection can act to shape um, the architecture and the behavior of organisms has been one of the most fascinating questions. Um, how that complexity arises out of random mutation and, and selection still is, is, is a wonderful mystery to me. Um, but hopefully through my career, I can shed a bit of light on that. Uh, I focus mostly on plant microbe interactions 
um, and very much am interested in how we can use the information um, that we uh, uncover about the architecture of complex systems to improve um, agriculture. Just a very quick introduction to our food system. I think it's helpful in framing um, the challenges that we have. As, as we all know, um, over the last few months, the, you know, the behavior of the food system and the essential nature of it um, and how, it, how it's had to repurpose itself um, very rapidly um, has just shown how, how much the food chain and the food system impinges on all parts of society and all parts of life. Um, and um, I think that the food supply system is at the uh, food supply chain at the core of the food system and it has inter interdependencies with politics, health, environment, society and economy. And I think really, um, you know, that's been brought into sharp relief recently. And so it's really important that we have a resilient supply chain. And um, I think it's interesting to think where robotics and the future of genetics fits into that. So to pose a question, why do we need automation? Um, I think many people tend to focus on um, a particular aspect of the need for automation, which is often um, framed around the availability of labor. But I think it goes far beyond that. Um, and I think we need to think much more about the wider drivers that face um, and challenges that face us uh, as a society and how robotics and the integration of robotics into everyday life can really um, help us address some of the big challenges that we have. Um, food, food supply, we need to um, grow more food than ever before. It's predicted by some that we will need to produce 50% more food than we do currently in 2050. Um, and we have to do that with no um, measurable environmental, negative environmental impact. In fact, we actually have to start mitigating against the um, effects that we've already had on our ecosystem. So um, I think it's really, really important to think about how robotics fits into that. Um, a changing climate, um, often people point to um, the fact that um, bringing, um, growing and controlling it more, bringing it indoors um, actually protects against um, shocks in the supply chain by changing the range of crops that one can grow locally under protection. Um, but of course, we must understand the feedback between how in doing so we may further affect the climate. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and of course, uh, we must realize that, um, again, thinking about coronavirus, the, it's been brought into sharp relief how we must have healthy and nutritious diets because they are one of the primary ways of protecting ourselves against illness. And so the demand for year round supply of fresh fruit and vegetables um, is, uh, is projected obviously to go up and it's in everybody's benefit that it does. So I just thought I'd dwell for a moment on, on one, of the, one of the things that is often um, talked about, in, certainly in the agricultural sector, as, as almost being synonymous with robotics and robotic farming, and that's vertical farming. Um, it's clearly one of the large growth industries um, in, worldwide and is, is um, proposed to um, increase by four or five fold in the next five years. Um, and we can see that happening already in the UK, and I think probably many of you are working on projects that directly um, are um, in this space. Um, and, you know, it, at its best, it can be um, seen as a, a way of producing locally grown, quick to market um, fresh fruit and veg, um, you know, shortening supply chains, having better traceability, better integrity in, in the food system. And um, that's already sort of here. Um, and of course, many people are thinking that it, it is a method of reducing our reliance on food imports. As I said, it's a natural bedfellow with automation. And when we think about designing um, systems for um, vertical production, they're also um, ideal for thinking about systems for automated production. Um, and, you know, there's, there's obviously a clear labor sa saving um, component to that, as well as um, thinking maybe more about how we design the systems to maximize production efficiencies. And over the last um, few years, I was lucky enough to have something called an Upfield Farming Scholarship, where I um, was sponsored to go around the world and look at um, some aspects of horticultural, horticultural production. Um, I was very interested in seeing um, what the future might hold for production of soft fruit, of strawberries, um, because that's an area that um, I've worked on quite a lot. Um, while I was at East Morling. And it struck me very early on that there are some 
really major challenges around um, how we um, think about the rise of vertical farming and indoor production and uh, some real questions about its sustainability. So I'll just dwell quickly on that. If we look at world fossil fuel consumption, um, we, we sort of think that the world is being electrified. Um, but um, when you look at fossil fuel consumption, only about 15% of our total fossil fuel consumption is for the generation of electricity. And of course, we hope that to fall, uh, for that to, to fall. And um, so, you know, it's widely touted that renewables are becoming a big part of, um, in terms of electricity generation, becoming a big part of it. But that's really only 15% of the problem and still 80% um, until very recently of our energy demands have been met by fossil fuel. And if we're going to reach net zero, um, we really must reduce our, our dependency um, on fossil fuel. We must halve it by um, in, in the next 10 years. And thinking about what that fossil fuel is used for, um, quite a lot of it is for generation of heat. Um, and that's a really big factor when it comes into thinking about indoor and protected production, because we burn a lot of gas uh, at the moment to produce heat to grow our crops. Um, and if we look at the trend, it's going in the wrong direction in terms of energy demand. Um, if you just, I mean, and it's, it's maybe foolish to do so, but if you extrapolate a straight line out from where we, where we are for the next um, 30 years, we're probably going to use 50% more energy per capita by 2050. Um, and um, that's sort of um, quite a worrying thought if we're not able to rapidly decarbonize. And then of course it leads to questions about if we um, are able to do that, what the demands will be on land use for um, green energy production. So that's just to sort of frame where we are, um, but also to note um, that our current production systems are, are also um, not that sustainable. So when we, um, when I when I travelled to South Africa, I I was lucky enough to go and see some strawberry production there. And just to say, it's it's um, you know taking horticultural production out to um, you know all around the world and replicating the systems that were developed in Europe has been hugely successful and has really changed people's lives and livelihoods. Um, in, um, in and around the world, um, you know, growing fruit for export has led to schools being built, has led to people having proper jobs and so on. Um, but it also um, has intensified in some areas the demands placed on the natural world. And so in South Africa around Cape Town, I went at the absolute um, maximum um, sort of um, time when they were experiencing drought. Um, and it really um, sort of brought into stark relief the fact that so many crops were irrigated um, and that water was being exported effectively um, to Europe for consumption um, into, you know, embedded in the fresh fruit. And kilo for kilo, um, roughly, the because a lot of this fruit is air freighted, for every kilo of um, strawberries or any fruit that you export, around about five kilos of CO2 are emitted. Um, so, I think it's really, really important to consider that the systems that we have now are not fit for purpose um, and the systems that we're thinking about moving to in the future in terms of vertical farming must be, be designed with sustainability in mind. Um, so just to try and again capture energy usage um, for outdoor versus indoor crops, if we take tomato as an example, the latest data I could get hold of was Dutch tomato production in 2012. And although yield per unit area is about four times higher indoors than outdoors, energy use is about 175 times higher. Um, and if you take the amount of energy used for tomato production um, and um, compare that to the total energy use in UK agriculture, it's about 22% of um, energy use for, um, in, the, you know, in the UK for agriculture is about the total that's used just for the tomato production in the Netherlands. At least it was 10 years ago, but it is very rapidly changing. And that equates to around 7% of all um, CO2 emissions from agriculture is scaled by, um, by um, you know, in terms of um, emissions. And that's not CO2 equivalent emissions, that's direct CO2 emissions. So that's not taking into account methane and things like that from agriculture. But I think this, this brings into kind of sharp relief the fact that we do need to think quite differently about our production systems and we need to design systems that um, avoid both generating and adding to the emissions problem um, but also um, are much less uh, deleterious in terms of environmental impacts and I think there's a lot of opportunity um, if we can solve the energy problem um, in um, intensive production systems, indoor production systems of having a much lower environmental footprint in the longer term but we have to get it right. So 
I started thinking about um, or looking at different scenarios for production uh, and trying to estimate the amount of um, energy in gigawatt hours per tonne um, that was used in um, production. So I'll just walk through this uh, a little slower. So if we take UK strawberry production, this is mostly outdoor production, 1,200 hectares annually um, used for strawberry production, about 0 0.004 gigawatt hours per tonne in terms of energy use. If we take Dutch tomatoes, um, again from the 2012 data set, 1,600 or 1,700 hectares, 0 0.007. Um, now, if we were to take current strawberry production and current strawberry yields and put them in an intensive tomato system, um, we would actually use about tenfold um, more, and well, sorry, threefold more energy um, than um, if we were growing tomatoes in that same glass house because of the lower yields of strawberry versus tomato. So um, we can't just take our current crops and move them into intensive systems because the, first of all, they won't be cost effective, um, but um, environmentally you can see per tonne the, the um, amount of energy use and therefore emissions would be extraordinarily high. Um, so, um, sorry, I, I said that slightly wrong. This is our current strawberry systems. They use about three times more energy uh, in glasshouse production than, than the current tomato system. If we were to take our, if we were to take the tomato model and grow strawberries with the same amount of energy, it would be 10 times less efficient. Sorry about that. Um, so um, that shows that we can't just um, adopt systems um, you know, that are used in other crops and, and take them out to other horticultural crops. So something needs to change. And I, I think that that's both the growing system and um, the genetics, which is what I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So let's ask ourselves the question, what if we could increase the yield of strawberries? And how would that improve efficiency? So if we take the same data again, but instead we imagine that instead of a, what is roughly now a 60 tonne per hectare crop in a glasshouse system, if we could push that to 500 tonnes a hectare, which sounds completely unbelievable, but if we could, we could actually take the gigawatt hours, the, the amount of energy that's used down even lower than current outdoor production um, based, on, based on the life cycle analyses that have been done. This may not be enough um, in, to make them truly sustainable, but I would argue that it, probably when you take the basket of environmental benefits that you would get from moving things indoors in terms of water footprint and so on, it would probably be a, a net gain in terms of um, environmental, positive environmental outcomes. Um, so let's imagine for a minute that we can take it to 500 tonnes a hectare, which by the way is where tomatoes sit. So in terms of a tomato crop, you would, you would easily get 500 tonnes a hectare nowadays in an intensive production system. Um, it's actually genetics that's a limiting factor for strawberries. What it would also do is take the land area for strawberries from around 4,200 hectares, which on, on, in the grand scheme of things isn't much, um, but it would reduce it down to around 277 hectares. So our entire, roughly 80% of our nas national strawberry production could be grown in 277 hectares. So it's worth thinking about how we might do that. Um, crucially, I think, you know, what's important to look at is what that would do in terms of the indirect use of land. Um, and so if we take a low intensity production system, um, current genetics of strawberries, 60 tonnes a hectare, if we tried to run that just using electricity um, or heat from renewables, we would actually need about 60,000 hectares of land to generate the amount of energy that you need to heat and light that glasshouse. So you can see that the numbers don't really add up for that. And in terms of solar, you would need about 2,400 hectares. So that's about half the area that's used at the moment in terms of growing strawberries. You just need that to generate solar. You would never use just solar power to, to, um, to run a glass house, but it's just an illustration about the onward effects that it has on land use. Um, if you were to take the 500 ton a hectare example, um, we are looking at, um, you know, a, more or less a tenfold reduction in both of them. For biomass, um, you know, uh, sort of produced energy, it's still a huge land area. Um, for solar, it's a lot lower. So there's a good case for thinking that if we, if we crack the, um, the um, yield and intensity of our um, production systems, there are viable green solutions that could be used. Um, I mean, it's still a lot of solar, but there are lots of ways of generating uh, 
waste heat, for example, using waste heat that could be um, mean that the actual expansion of land would be quite low. So thinking about that, thinking about the opportunities that are actually there, um, how do we go about designing a crop to fit that system? So, you know, in terms of uh, yield per hectare, strawberries sit about 60 tonnes a hectare at the moment, how would we get them to 500 tonnes a hectare? Well, roughly, it means taking um, our current yield per plant from around 500 grams per plant to about two and a half kilos. That's actually doable. Um, we have, in when I used to um, oversee um, the, the genetics department at East Malling, we had lines that would readily yield two and a half kilos um, per plant. Um, so it's just making sure that they're designed in the right way and that have the right uh, consumer characteristics. So it is, although it sounds a little bit fantastical, it is an achievable um, aim. And at the heart of, and this is where I'm going to switch to talking a bit about genetics. So I do apologise. I've tried to make it as simple as possible, um, but I realise many of you are not from a biology background, but let's see how we get on. The, the maths isn't very hard. Um, the um, At the heart of all breeding and selection, there's um, a very simple equation called the breeder's equation. Um, it, it's not really used in the same way anymore as it used to be, but um, you know it, it illustrates um, the, um, the sort of the way that we think about how to change um, the um, performance of, of any uh, natural system. And it's all about selection. Um, so the response to selection, um, the amount of change in, in whatever trait you're selecting for that, maybe that's height, let's imagine, um, is a function of the heritability of that trait. So how much of that trait is controlled by genetic variation and specifically of that genetic variation, how much of that total genetic variation combines in an additive fashion. So that means that variant A gives you a, maybe a one centimetre change in height, variant B um, in the genome gives you an extra one centimetre, and you put A and B together and you get a change of two centimetres. Non-additive genetic variation where variant A might control one centimetre, variant B might control one centimetre, but you put them together and somehow the height changes by 20 centimetres. That's a property of biological systems. Um, but it's not very easy to use that in selection programs. So, um, although of course, um, if you use the right model, you can. But in general, breeders tend to like to se select upon the additive component of the genetic variation. And so the heritability here just represents um, the proportion of total variation that is additive. Um, and then you have the selection differential, and that's how strongly you're, you're actually running your selection program. How, where from the distribution your parents sit that make the um, make the offspring for the next generation. And so if they're very close to the mean, you, you don't get a great response to selection. If they're very far away and you've got lots of additive genetic variation, you can make genetic gain very quickly, um, you know, per unit of time. And of course, this is what humans have done for um, thousands of years. And so many of you may know um, maize, corn on the cob. Um, originally, it was a plant, wild, wild plant called teosinte. It was domesticated into what we now know as maize. And in doing this domestication, we completely changed the plant architecture. We changed the, the, um, the, the number of flowering um, sort of spikes, the uh, number of branches, um, the root architecture, and so on and so forth, in order to go from something that looked a bit like this to something that looks a bit like that. Now, um, we, you can just do that by selecting and taking the best from every generation um, and not really knowing what you're doing. Um, but um, nowadays we tend to use a more um, sophisticated framework called genomic selection. And this combines our knowledge of what's happening at the DNA level with the genetic variation and the amount of genetic variation that's there with a breeding scheme that allows us to, um, instead of having to wait to see how the next generation performs in the field, we can predict how that generation performs and, and do our selection um, based upon our estimated performance from our genetic data without having to directly measure the performance in the field. So what this means is you, you take a model and you train it, you get a population that's drawn from your larger breeding population, you get all the genetic information and um, phenotypic information, so models of, of performance for yield and height and disease resistance. You take all those measurements, you associate the gene, gen, genotype and phenotype together um, 
using a um, regression model of some kind. That gives you the ability to then predict um, based upon genotype alone. And so you select upon genotype um, and you may do this multiple times, um, you know, you, and then you cross for the next generation and you keep doing selection. And at some point you pull stuff out for trial um, and that might be after one generation, it might be after several. And then you go through a trialing situation, which then hones your, um, the performance of your selected individuals. And at the end, you get to a variety. That's how a lot of modern breeding programs, uh, more or less to, to a first approximation work. So this gives us the power to both run things faster because we can predict the performance of individuals, um, but also potentially spend a lot more money on our training population measuring a much wider basket of traits than we would normally be able to afford to do and therefore be able to change things um, much more um, simultaneously than we would if we were having to measure each individual trait in the field um, within, a, within a given year. So um, it really changes the structure of how breeding is done. So I'm going to give you an example of that um, and it's a, an example um, that we worked on uh, in strawberry um, and what we did was we created um, a training population uh, and this was um, a multiple parent population where we took two parents and crossed them together in a in a, 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 a kind of combination that linked together all the families um, and so we have a sort of partially linked population where we can explore um, genetic variation and how it behaves across multiple cross events so um, that allows us to, to more accurately estimate the additive components of the ge genetic variation. Um, we took genotypic data, so we measured the um, level of genetic variability in each individual, um, and then we can make something called a genomic relationship matrix, which tells us the relationship between all the individuals. Um, and you can clearly see that there's family structure in here, that each of the blue squares is, is how the families behave, and that this is how the families are related to one another. Um, so that's a powerful resource in terms of then investing time to measure different traits on. And of course, you can, you can have multiple, multiple different selection criteria coming out of this population and you can be simultaneously optimizing to different, different optima depending on um, how you're running your onward selection and crossing schemes. So what we did was we tried to measure um, a, lot of, um, a lot of traits related to fruit quality because um, we're working with industry partners and they're very interested obviously in having the highest quality of, uh, of fruit going into, um, into their programs and coming out onto the supermarket shelves. And so we went through quite a, a long um, phenotyping pipeline where we would um, take harvest ripe fruit, we would take the, the mass of those fruit, the class of the fruit, fruit so how how good it is in terms of supermarket performance. We do um, visual assessments on shape, calyx size, aching density, those are the sort of the seeds of strawberry, their color, their position, glossiness, skin color, uniformity, and so on and so forth. All of the traits that, that you know, people, uh, breeders routinely measure to try and select the best um, fruit. Um, we, we then also did in parallel, did 3D imaging, firmness measurements, try to get as many non-destructive measures as, as we could to correlate to these subjective measures. Um, we did a uh, tactile assessment, uh, we measured bricks, so that's the sugars, we measured pH, um, and we did a load of organoleptic taste tests. Um, so that's the breeders ranking how the things tasted. Now, all of this would have hugely benefited from having an automated robotic system, but we just used students. So um, th this was a large experiment. So this was um, 400 or so varieties, five, at least five replicates in a, in a randomized block design, um, three fruits from each plant. So we were measuring hundreds of, of plants and for each fruit generating hundreds of data points. So it was, a, it was an enormous bit of work to do. Um, and not all of it went to plan as I'll talk about in a minute, but we managed to get something decent out of it. Um, the bit I'm going to focus on a little bit is um, the 3D imaging, just to, just to give you a flavour of, of what we can do now and I think what might be the potential in the future. These are all the traits that we measured and this just illustrates a plot um, that tries to combine um, some of the information that, that, that is, is useful to us. So on this axis we have the accuracy of prediction, so that's how well 
our genetic prediction model matches with what we actually observe. This is the amount of the level of heritability, so the additive genetic variation for each trait. So this tells us how much genetic control there is over, over each particular trait that we've measured. And then this tells us something about the architecture of the trait. So how many individual genetic variants are contributing to that trait? Um, and you can see that some things are highly heritable. We can predict with fairly good accuracy. Um, and are under differential levels of genetic control. And so just to give you another example of this, this is um, acidity perception. Um, this seems to be under pretty simple genetic control. So this is a diagram that shows all the different chromosomes that are there in strawberry. Don't worry about the details, but strawberry has um, 28 chromosomes. Um, it has four distinct copies of each. So it's a, a base number of seven and then four different, um, sort of slightly different chromosomes because it's something called a polyploid. Um, so it has um, eight different copies of each gene um, that have come from different evolutionary origins. Um, not so important. The, the, the point is that for acidity perception, a single um, locus, a single genomic region on a single chromosome seems to be controlling most of the differences in acidity perception. If we contrast that to something like skin firmness, what we can see here is again, same chromosomes, everything in pink is significant. We see that there is a huge amount of genetic variation that um, is contributing to skin firmness um, from all around the genome. And the effect sizes of these um, genetic variants can be quite small. And so what you then have is um, a situation where it's under polygenic control. And so there are no um, you know, smoking guns to go in and say, oh, if we just select that genetic variant every time we'll get firm fruit, we have to combine all of those genetic loci um, in order to get firmer fruit. So that's sort of a practical example of what we, what we got out of it. In terms of the 3D imaging, we really wanted to be able to take all of the subjective measures that breeders measure um, on, you know, about fruit quality and get a, a suite of objective measures that we can automatically capture through um, 3D imaging. Limited success at this. I think if we were doing it again, we'd do it much better, but, you know, that's how science works. Um, we had a rotating um, table that, um, that rotated uh, at a rate that we were able to take 50, 50 images from a single camera. Um, and uh, we replicated this. We had six imaging stations. Um, so we were able to measure uh, fruit simultaneously. It took about a minute for each each fruit. We could then um, and uh, start to um, extract information out of that. We did Aegisoft um, software um, and um, pre-processing and and um, and some arbitrary background sub uh, subtraction through um, color thresholding. Um, one of the major problems that we that we identified was not all strawberries look like this. So when you examine the full amount of genetic variation that's there, um, you can capture um, a fairly good complete strawberry image if your if your strawberry is shaped like this. But a lot of strawberries are pretty flat, um, and um, because of the, the angle of our camera, um, we missed the bottom of it quite a, quite often, um, which was. Um, a, a big weakness then in terms of trying to extract meaningful shape parameters for the strawberry. Um, but what we were able to do was sort of take this middle part of the strawberry and look at um, fruit uniformity um, and be able to um, extract genetic information about the uniformity of the strawberries um, from just using this um, sort of middle part of the image. A um, little bit frustrating, it would have been nicer to, to have a, a bit more data, but um, you live and learn. But we, um, we were able to extract quite a lot of um, genetic information instead of a circular plot. I'm showing you a linear plot here. And each, each dot here of different types um, gives us the um, genetic control of some of the features that we've extracted um, from those 3D images. Um, and we can combine these in such a way to get an overall estimate of fruit uniformity, which is an important breeding characteristic. So it, it wasn't wasted. Um, but we certainly there is room for improvement there. So that kind of um, gives gives a little summary of, of the kind of stuff that we can do right now. 
um, and I'm just going to talk in a minute about what we can do maybe in the future. But at the moment, we can combine all of the information for the traits that we've measured in such a way that allows us to then predict the optimal plant genotypes. Um, and then we can start, and this is happening now in our breeding programs, we can start turning the handle a little bit faster and moving to um, be able to optimize fruit quality parameters quite quickly through cycling rapidly through generations, um, always optimizing to these estimated breeding values that we've taken from our training population. So it, it speeds up the breeding process. But that's not what the title of my talk is. The title of my talk is robotics, you know, designing plants for robots. So what about more complicated problems? And this is where I, I speculate a little bit, but I think it's worth um, kind of um, running through what I think might be a route forward to um, capture a large number of traits and then really start to define what we want to see in terms of plant architecture for robotic system design. Um, and the framework that we might take to do that. So um, there's a thing called L systems models, which is used quite a lot in crop modeling. And it's just, it just describes simple branching processes. Um, so it's a formal language that describes the growth of repeating branching systems. And so this is a really simple example that I just nicked off Wikipedia. Um, and it just shows a simple um, sort of uh, branching pattern defined by this sort of formalized language here, which is, is fairly, it looks a bit complicated, but it's fairly simplistic in terms of just defining when to branch, when, at what degree, and at what frequency. And um, this represents obviously what a lot of natural systems look like, it looks like a tree branch or a fern. And that's because of course, plants um, operate on this branching principle as well. So you can go from quite quickly from fairly simplistic branching models to quite sophisticated um, three-dimensional models of crops using these L system um, notation. And so this is um, um, an example that I linked to um, from um, this website here, this Open Alia project. This is maize. Um, and once you have a three-dimensional model, you can start to simulate things like light interception. And so you can set parameters that, that then allow you to quantify what's happening at the plant level in terms of shading response and so on and so forth. And as you manipulate the architecture of the plant, you can look at the effect that that has on some some other mechanistic processes like photosynthetic rate, you know, which then correlates to yield. And so I think this modeling framework is a very useful way of starting to think about how to simulate virtual systems. And so this is a tree. Um, and what you can do is use things like point cloud data that you know, we use to, to reconstruct 3D images of our strawberries, but you can use them to uh, reconstruct these complex topologies and then use that to parameterize your L systems model. Um, and I think this is where the power comes in. So I think if we start to do this, we could then use these L systems models to simulate what optimal plant architectures might look like in silico. So before we ha even have to grow the plant, define what the optimal architecture is for our growing system. Uh, you know, and that could be robotic performance or it could be um, you know, light interception, light efficiency in a, in a particular system. Define those optimal trait combinations, and just as I described earlier, plug those into our genomic selection models and start using the genomic selection tools to then optimize to that new architecture um, for whatever traits, combination of traits we're interested in. This is barely being done at the moment, but I think it's where we should be going and what we should be doing. And of course, Implicit in everything I've said in terms of selecting on genetic variation is the fact that that genetic variation has to be there. Well, we know a huge amount about the molecular architecture of complex traits now. We know how things like branching and flowering are controlled at the molecular level. And when you're running a genetic improvement program, you can only select on the genetic variation that's there. But now we have the opportunity to introduce targeted genetic variation that may not exist in natural systems because the natural systems, the genetic variation that's there is a product itself of natural selection. And so things that really dramatically change plant architecture are just removed from the system by purifying selection. They're not fit in the environment, so they're removed. So the mutational space, the kind of the, the trait landscape that you can explore from natural variation is very different from the trait space that you can explore from Arti well, artificial variation or mutations that you induce in a targeted way. So they would arise um, by chance in nature, 
but the 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 um, probability of you observing them is quite low because they're kept at low frequencies by things like purifying natural selection. So using things like CRISPR that many of you will have heard of, gene editing, we can take the knowledge that we have from molecular biology, introduce novel mutations, and then use our genomic selection schemes and our crop modeling to then um, harness that genetic variation. And of course, we can do this faster than ever before. So there is a thing in, um, in, in the genetics kind of world called speed breeding. All it really means is going from seed to seed as fast as you possibly can. And so the rate of genetic gain per unit time using rapid cycling or speed breeding can really um, help us move very quickly. Rather than taking thousands of data maze, we could probably do it in tens of years or even less, link together our knowledge of the genetic architecture, genomic selection, and speed breeding. And so I think this is where we, we are currently at now um, in terms of being able to design crops for automation. If I was thinking about strawberry, the first thing I would focus on is the inflorescence architecture. Um, you know, breeders have already done a lot to simplify. I think more could be done to make it more amenable to robotic harvesting. Um, but there are any number of traits that you could think about, depending on the system that you choose, um, that you could select upon to really change the behaviour of the plant to fit a robotic system. Um, I'm just going to wrap up now. Um, I'm on about 40 minutes. Um, genetics is definitely an easy way to make environmentally sustainable yield gains, um, but we have to model the system appropriately. Um, but the current opportunity, say in strawberry, is to take us from a kilo, you know, or less per plant, really up to two, two and a half kilos. And that will really change the way that we can produce and grow crops affordably and sustainably. But those systems have to really be designed from the start in such a way to avoid locking in um, emissions. We have to think about what's happening in the wider world in terms of the changes to our energy systems, our energy networks, the opportunity to use waste heat sources, the opportunity to maybe use, um, you know, work that supply demand curve a bit harder and use energy when other people don't want it um, to, to make it affordable, but also make sure that we're using green energy. And that should really extend to that co-design of plant and robot to the wider system to ask, how do we um, start to um, make these transitions from unsustainable agriculture to sustainable agriculture in the most um, economically efficient way. I think a big part of that is doing um, life cycle assessment. So coupling all of that genetic knowledge and knowledge of our system with a really robust way to um, take the outputs of our models and estimate the total environmental footprint um, of them. So I I'm mentioning this because I think, you know, maybe as scientists or, or you know, as multidisciplinary teams, we don't think enough about what the total effects of our system design are on the environment but we do have an opportunity to if we can model things in silico to start to estimate those pretty accurately at the design stage and refine and iterate our designs in order to um, ensure that they are truly environmentally sustainable um, so yeah expanded life cycle assessment to model current and future systems is really important i think you know the cdt is a great opportunity to start this kind of systems level research and these kind of collaborations, but I think we need more more sort of joined up thinking in terms of how we fund these things and um, to stimulate this research further. And a real emphasis on coupling together the kind that in the in the plant world with your, you know, the the shift to digital twinning a lot of um, you know robotic systems and engineering um, systems, putting those two things together and being able to have a a whole environment in which we can simulate um, both the crop and the behavior of the, the whole system is is quite important. So I shall finish there. Um, I just want to thank my collaborators. So Helen Cockerton um, did a lot of the, um, the phenotypic data gathering and coordination and genetic analysis. She's a very talented uh, quantitative geneticist. Bo Lee, um, who was a postdoc as well in my group at the time, now a lecturer at UWE. Um, did a lot of the image analysis. Um, Ellie really helped with the uh, crop physiology side of things and Abby was our fruit breeder and so really created the genetic populations that we used as part of the, um, part of the um, work. 
and we were funded by BBSLC Innovate UK and our industry. This was an agri-tech grant that Sainsbury's and Solarberry were partners in. And also I must acknowledge the Nuffield for allowing me to travel around and refine my thoughts. So thanks very much. I'm done. Hopefully there's a bit of time for questions. Okay, brilliant. Wow, this is a really, really exciting talk and we learn a, a lot of things. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, I, I have a um, few questions, but before uh, starting, um, if you have any questions, you can speak up uh, or you can uh, put some questions in the chat window. So uh, let me just uh, ask first couple of questions. So uh, I'm, I'm just curious, you say um, the cycle time of you know, this testing uh, seed to seed, uh, you say make, make it really quicker nowadays, but what, what is actually the time scale of this? Is this, this the days or weeks or months? Depends or on the crop. Depends on the crop. I, I believe, I believe, but I believe with maize, they can run, if you do it right, you can get about six generations a year. Um, whereas obviously in the field, you may get one or two if, you, if you're kind of shuttling between um, regions. Um, you know, with strawberries, maybe you might get two or three if you try really hard there's a lot of vernalization requirements for strawberries and things like that that mean that you have to give them a period of chilling and then a short days and then all sorts of things you know that they expect to see of course in a in a in a vertical system or a, an artificially controlled system we could change all of that but um you know you could certainly run a few generations a year so it, it depends on the crop an apple tree mm, still going to take a few years for an apple tree to grow um but i believe um, that if you do it right, you can get um, probably about um, from seed to seed in around about eighteen months. Um, if you if you if you kind of trick it into thinking that it's it's mature, but I might it might be a little bit longer than that. But. Mm. So digital twin approach will be really the breakthrough if you can do that. Exactly. Yeah. I think really exploring that parameter space, mm -hmm. you know, through modeling will will stop a lot of dead ends. You know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, um, another question, or well, there's no other question yet, so maybe I can just take a privilege here. Uh, I, another question I had is, so your, your title was Designing Plans for Robots, but I was also wondering Designing Plans by Robots. Um, <laughs> it, it, what, what do you think is the most useful way in exploiting robots to speed up or facilitate your uh, research project uh, from your point of view? I mean, I, I think, you know, managing an unruly bunch of students um, you know, is, is, a, is a logistical challenge. If we could automate phenotyping far more, if we could scale that you know, in a greenhouse um, to be able to automatically capture all these data points um, and do some of the more dexterous handling things, you know, looking at subjective measures of firmness, maybe there's a, a robotic way of actually doing that. But at the moment we have this thing called a firm tech, which is just a rotating platter that you put a a fruit on and then it kind of prods it a bit but you know when you're trying to measure skin strength you know mm -hmm. you do that with your fingers you you kind of and having robot robots that could get some of those you know more complex multi kind of sensorial measures could be mm -hmm. really valuable so i think on the trait gathering side mm -hmm. bringing the price point down of that to a level where you can measure lots of things simultaneously both do destructive and non-destructive sampling really really valuable um mm -hmm. You know, and then of course, um, you know the, the obvious things in the field afterwards, or, or in the in the glass house of automating um, harvesting and, and you know crop monitoring and things like that. But you know, I think they're they're obviously a key area of active focus of everybody. But maybe moving up the up the pipeline a bit more would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you know the the, the robotic harvesting technologies are doing a very similar thing as you're doing, and the, you know they're doing it for completely different purposes, but technology itself is actually the same. So um, th there should be a really more communication, more collaboration, so that uh, we um, don't uh, reinvent the wheels, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so you, you talk about the energy. Oh, sorry. Is anyone else who want to? I have a question for me. Uh, for oh, okay, go ahead, for you. Uh, hi, Richard. Thank you for the great talk. Um, uh, just a curiosity from a very ignorant perspective. Uh, you talked about uh, um, efficiency, energy efficiency, and genetics. So when we combine them together, do we know what are the switches, the mechanisms to make a plant more efficient? 
in terms, for example, if I want to grow with less light in vertical farming, do we know what are the genetic? Uh, yeah, I think I think we do. I mean, I don't, but <laughs> I think others do. Um, I mean, there's you know there's fundamental limitations in terms of photosynthesis, um, but I mean, thinking a bit more about the regulation of that photosynthesis, whether um, in fact, I think I saw a paper yesterday that, that showed that actually, you know, some of the major components of photosynthesis, there were some changes that were just locked in and suboptimal at the branch of, um, you know, the, the base of branching plants that, that, that could be changed. So you can change the photosynthetic uh, machinery, and I think people are trying to do that. Well, they're definitely trying to do that. Um, one of the things that you might also want to change is the, you know, the dynamic response of the plant to the combinations of light and temperature because it will perceive in the environment that a, a, a certain temperature and light um, sort of threshold it will kick in a particular part of its developmental program. I think putting a bit more attention into dissecting that may mean that we could select for much more efficient plants in terms of the available energy. Um, okay. You know photosynthesis they open the stomata at dawn they shut them at dusk you know well, what if there is no dawn and dusk? And that runs on an endogenous circadian rhythm. You know, there's, I think there's lots of opportunities to take what we know about plant science and reflect it upon um, systems. And of course, in the modeling approach, you can ask what the output would be in terms of energy efficiency, um, you know, or energy utilization, which, which is very hard to do in a, in, a physical, in a physical setting because you would have to find a plant with that exact genetic variation in order to measure that, whereas if you simulate it, you say, "Well, what if?" Mm -hmm, then you mm -hmm. say, "Well, that's a trait that might be worth selecting towards." So, okay, and um, okay, very interesting. Another question related still to energy and vertical farming, uh, just to a back of envelope computation. If uh, in terms of energy consumption of um, vertical farming, if I had to provide energy through solar production. Will I need more or less land than the same amount of production directly on the land? So just say that first bit again. If you were... So if, if I need to provide energy to a vertical farm uh -huh. through solar panels, is mm -hmm. convenient in terms of energy or is better to plant uh, plants on the ground outside? Well, I think I think this is why maybe the, the idea is is moving through the, the vertical plane and really all of the, you know, I think um, you know, clearly per unit area, plants don't intercept all of the light. And so it's really about stacking the area so that even though your solar panels are only 25% efficient, you know, plants are only two or 3% efficient. So okay. if you can get them to capture, you know, more, more of that available energy through changing the, the sort of aerial, um, inter you know, the, the light interception in three dimensions, that's, I think that's where the gains are. Um, so. You know, and to do that, you obviously have to have a controlled environment and so on. So. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so it looks like there's no other uh, urgent question. So obviously, uh, Richard is always, uh, you know, within our community and he is always reachable uh, by email or by other means. So uh, we will, uh, if you have any questions or uh, ideas for collaborations, uh, he's always ha happy to talk with us. So please do uh, stay in touch with Richard. And uh, I would very, very much like to thank you for a beautiful uh, lecture today. Uh, we learned a lot of things and uh, this is a very good starting point of collaborations. Could, could I just say, I mean, I, I've focused on one particular crop, strawberries, but of course at NIAB there's a whole range of crop researchers working across the arable and horticultural spectrum. And so, you know, I'd be very happy to connect anyone into, you know, if they're interested in a particular crop or a particular question, to connect you into other people at NIAB to, to form those collaborations, because I think, you know, it's an area where a, a lot of us at NIAB are interested in, so. Very, very good. good. Yes, yes, thank you very much, yes. Um, and I would also like to remind everyone that we will have the next science seminar series on the October 16th, Friday, uh, from 3 p.m. Uh, so the next speaker is going to be Ian Flint from G's Growers. And obviously, G's is also a good collaborator of uh, NIAP. And uh, it's going to be a lot more uh, um, uh, business-oriented, industry-oriented uh, presentation next time. So. Uh, please do uh, uh, join our next uh, science seminar as well. 
Um, and otherwise, um, I think I'd like to uh, wish you a very nice weekend and we'll see you next time uh, in the science seminar series. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Bye-bye. Thank you.